But joining us now to discuss January 6th committee member, Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger of Illinois. Congressman, so we're learning that the Justice Department's investigation into what happened on January 6th and the months before it as well, uh, they're now looking at conduct related to Donald Trump and his closest allies. What's your reaction? Well, I think it's essential. I mean, I, I think the January 6th committee, though, we're not out to pursue criminal charges. We're simply out to make recommendations, tell the truth to the American people. I think what we've shown is that at least there's enough evidence that's worthy of the, of the investigation. The Department of Justice will make the decision of what threshold that reaches. Um, but I got to tell you, Jake, the thing I'm concerned about, yes, I mean, I think there is some serious concerns about stability uh, if a former president is indicted. But where my bigger concern is on stability is what happens to a country that says uh, a former president can attempt a coup and as long as he's unsuccessful, we let bygones be bygones. And, of course, if that president is successful, then he controls the, the government and the levers of government. So while this is a no-win situation, I certainly think this country cannot set a standard that you can cover up the law and you can attempt to overcome the will of the people. Your fellow committee member, Congressman Aguilar, told CNN today that the Justice Department has given a list of transcripts that they want your committee to prioritize handing over to them. Um, are you able to gain any insight into, into what the DOJ is focusing on based on which transcripts they're asking you to hand over? Yeah, we can. I, I don't want to go too much into, into the revelation of that. The committee is, is certainly you know, fine, obviously, working with DOJ. Uh, even though we're running two separate investigations, we want to ensure that you know, our investigation is complete and we can do what we want. But we will cooperate with the Department of Justice. And uh, again, you know, they have decisions to make. They have a lot of investigating, I'm sure, still left. But I think for the sake of this country and for stability, it is really important for them to pursue this, regardless of what the outcome of this is. Listen to what Attorney General uh, Garland told NBC News yesterday about whether Trump becoming a candidate or even the nominee uh, for the Republican Party for president would change their investigation. We will hold accountable anyone who is criminally responsible for attempting to interfere with the transfer, legitimate lawful transfer of power from one administration to the next. In your view, who are some of the people who you think definitively try to interfere with the transfer of power? Well, I personally think certainly the president. I mean, we've laid out multiple prong approaches that he started on from just calling out the legitimacy of the election and conspiracies to pressuring the vice president to attempting to change the Department of, of Justice, uh, any number of things, to finally on January 6th really not doing nothing, sitting back and proactively uh, – uh, resisting peer pressure, which he's actually not very good at doing usually, resisting that pressure to act, to kind of see, let's see what happens, you know, here at the Capitol. Let's see if they're successful. So I certainly think him, I think we've pre presented a strong case for Attorney uh, Eastman. Uh, that was in my hearing about the Department of Justice. So I think there's any number of people that could be along that line. But look, I, I, I think anybody that believes, and maybe I even had this thought kind of at the beginning, that the president was kind of along for the ride and people were just convincing him, that is not the case. As Liz Cheney said, he's not a toddler. He can think for himself. And it is quite obvious that he was determined to stay in power and tried multiple prongs and avenues to do that. Take a look at the House calendar. Um, members are home in your districts for most of August. You're back in session after Labor Day, uh, but then back home for the opportunity to campaign for re-election for most of October ahead of the midterms. Uh, the committee must be under a lot of pressure to release your interim report during September before committee members go home for October. Yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's, uh, I have learned on this committee that there really is no uh, break or recess. Even when we're home, <clears throat> we're working uh, remotely. The staff, uh, I think, is really the unsung heroes in all this. They've been doing, you know, God's work to get all the details together. And so, yeah, I think we intend to put out, uh, as mentioned, an interim report. The investigation continues, and uh, we can walk and chew gum. And, and I think every day that goes by, we get closer to more answers, Secret Service, for instance, uh, and everything else. So, uh, unfortunately, we don't get too much of an August when it comes to this committee, but it's important work for the American people, and we're happy to do it. What is the latest on the Secret Service? Because there were a whole bunch of whispers we heard from people next to, near the Secret Service saying that they would be willing to testify about that story, about whether or not um, then-Deputy Chief of Staff Tony Arnato told Cassidy Hutchinson that story about Trump lunging in the SUV 
Um, but my understanding, I think you, you told CNN uh, that talks had completely broken down and they weren't cooperating anymore, those three Secret Service agents, uh, uh, the, the gentleman uh, that was the actual Secret Service agent, Ornato, and the guy that drove the SUV. What, what's the status? Yeah, I mean, it's a pattern that we see, which is through anonymous sources, things are questioned at the committee. Uh, through anonymous sources, they say they're willing to come in and give counter evidence, and then they never do because we require them to be under oath. So as of now, we've not talked to these Secret Service agents. They've lawyered up, which is their right to do. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. We're, uh, the attorneys are, are engaging to figure out what's next. But, uh, yeah, that's, again, the standard kind of Trump operation pattern is through anonymous sources or through whisper campaigns, try to discredit people, but then not be willing to do it under oath. And Cassidy Hutchison has shown she is a brave American woman. And I think people like her, Sarah Matthews, Caroline Edwards will go down in history as, as having more courage than, frankly, almost every man in the Republican Party combined. <laughs> uh, your vice chair of the committee, Liz Cheney, told me on Sunday that the committee is prepared to consider subpoenaing Jenny Thomas, the wife of the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, if she does not appear before the committee voluntarily, when would that decision be ma made? Uh, so that's a so the lawyers are really good at kind of knowing when they're in legitimate negotiations, which is all part of this is all standard, or when they're being stalled. And typically, what we've seen is. Uh, they'll come to us and say, hey, they're just stalling right now. And that's when we issue a subpoena. So I think when we get to that threshold, we will. We're not treating Ginny Thomas any differently because of her last name. We've, we've you know, discovered more and more sort of involvement, some of which has been reported openly, uh, about her involvement with Eastman or trying to convince state electors. So we want to talk to her. And she said through the media that she'd be willing to come in and, in fact, is eager to come in and talk to us. So hopefully we can get there. If not, we'll do what we need to do to make sure we can. Uh, lastly, on a separate topic, we're seeing the Democratic Party is, is funding MAGA Republicans in these Republican primary elections in the hopes that, they, that those MAGA Republicans who are more extreme uh, win the primary, then it would be easier for Democrats to beat them in the general election. Uh, Democrats are now doing this uh, to Peter Meyer, Republican congressman from Michigan. He's one of the few Republicans, as I don't need to tell you because there are only 10 of you, who voted to impeach Donald Trump for the insurrection. Uh, what do you make of this? Yeah, we are a small crew. Governor Pritzker spent, you know, 30 million of his own money to promote an election denier candidate who's now our uh, Republican nominee. It's ridiculous. I, I have Democrats all the time, and I'm glad they're speaking out on this. That come to me and say, where are all the good Republicans? You just have to look at this. Country First, which I have, country1st.com. We're actually trying to get Democrats to vote in these primaries for good people that actually support the Constitution. And so I'd encourage people to do that. That's where your effort's spent because democracy is at stake. And when you spend money promoting these bad election denying candidates, I don't know if you fully understand how at risk we are. Well, there's a, I mean, a lot of smart Democrats I know think there's a big red wave coming. A lot of these fringe folks could end up swept into state houses and the U.S. Capitol. I'll go one further. There will be some of these candidates that were promoted that end up in office and end up doing real damage. Uh, you know, just look at the governor of Pennsylvania. That's a competitive race. Look at, you know, Illinois, et cetera. Um, you will see that after November. Uh, it's a very dangerous game to play. You're playing with fire. You play with fire, you're going to get burned. Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger of Illinois, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it.